Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Miss Martian, B, 0, 5. Welcome to the cave, everyone, and welcome also to our fifth installment of Secret Origins. In this series, we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, the heroes, the supporting cast, and even the villains. Today, we're exploring the relatively short comics history of Megan Morse a.k.a. Miss Martian. As I've said on the show, Miss M wasn't well known to me when the series started, so her background and character development was a complete surprise. A glorious, incredible surprise. So let's dive in. No, please, stop. Love you? I can't even look at you. (laughs) Oh, but you wouldn't do to prevent that now, right? That's right. Now, now, my pretty. I know you don't want to do anything you'll regret. You don't know me at all. So the first appearance of Miss Martian is in Teen Titans Volume 3, number 37, about 10 years ago in August of 2006. And she was created by Jeff Johns and Tony Daniel. So her origin story, uh, McGann was named after Jeff John's friend, Megan Morse, who's the wife of Marvel Comics editor Ben Morse, which is kind of funny. We get a bit of McGann's origin in the series, or at least the major through line, which is that she's actually a member of the minority race of white Martians on Mars. And she came to Earth originally pretending to be a green Martian. But there are some intriguing differences and some parallels. Uh, actually, between the comic history and the Young Justice version. In the comics, McGann was first sent to the Vega system to escape the Martian Civil War. But how and when she came to Earth seems to be a little bit vague in the comics. She is a member of the Titans for a period of time, but she leaves when she is suspected of being a traitor, interestingly enough. What's really interesting to me is that, like in Young Justice, it turned out that her accuser... A character named Bombshell was actually the traitor, and she returned to the team after the deception was uncovered. In the Titans Tomorrow story arc, McGann faces a future version of herself who has turned evil and embraced her white heritage. Though her future self is killed, this evil alternate McGann manages to telepathically implant herself in present-day McGann's mind, causing a kind of severe personality conflicts and challenges, a storyline that could be very interesting if they decide to dive into that in a future season of Young Justice. The rest of McGann's appearances are a bit all over the place, and you can find out more at the wiki link that we're going to put in the show notes. But there's one villain in storyline I think may potentially show up in a future season, so let's talk about that for a sec. At one point in the comics, the Titans face a, a villainous version of Titans East that was created by Deathstroke, he of the black-orange suit, who took Sportsmaster's place on the light in Young Justice if you're only doorway into the DC Universe's Young Justice, that's where you see him. One of Deathstroke's recruits in Titans East is a woman named Deborah Morgna, aka Sun Girl. Given the Martian issues with heat and flame, Sun Girl's powers are a pretty significant threat to McGann. The twist is that Sun Girl claims that she's from the future, a future in which Martians are slaves, thanks to something that McGann does in the present. In fact, Sun Girl claims that McGann herself is one of Sun Girl's own slaves. So, though the show may not want to redo an entire season of an alternate future storyline a la Blue Beetle, it's already opened the door for smaller alternate future story arcs. On a personal note, though... I love this. Greg Weissman and Brandon Vietti have embraced such a huge and galaxy-spanning piece of the DC universe that the appearance of Sun Girl actually implies something else, which makes this fanboy really happy. I mentioned a few times that I grew up on a series called Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. For those that don't know, the Legion is a group of teenage heroes in the 30th at least when I was a kid, it was the 30th, now it's the 31st century, collected from planets across the galaxy who were inspired by the historic heroism of Superboy slash Superman. One of those heroes was named Dirk Morgna, aka Sun Boy. An appearance by the Young Justice versions of the Legion may literally be a dream come true for me. And if this sounds like a stretch, I offer one more bit 
of Young Justice lore that we haven't gotten to in our show yet. In season two of Young Justice, one of the major subplots revolves around a planet called the Polyglotcher of Rimbor. Rimbor is not a random planet. Rimbor is a planet that's well known to Legion fans as the home of the Legionnaire Ultra Boy. I've mentioned Ultra Boy before, which is interesting, in our review of the episode Schooled, because Amazo's one power at a time mechanic feels very much like Ultra Boy's abilities, which are, I have all the powers of Superboy, but I really only have one power at a time. So between the appearance of Rimbor, (laughs) specifically... And Amazo's one power at a time, Ultra Boy-like mechanic, I can't help but think that someone on the creative team is a Legion fan. And since I've grown to love and adore McGann over the course of two seasons of Young Justice, having her storyline herald the appearance of one of my most beloved superhero teams would be, simply put, amazing. Having this sun girl, Debra Morgna, be either a co-confederate or precursor of Dirk Morgana as Sunboy? Oh, man, I don't know. My, my mind's blowing right now. But let's get back on track with him again. So I, I mentioned before, too, that the Martians have a wide... <laughs> Martian Manhunter's had a wide range of powers in the comics over the years. And he's basically Superman plus. So superhuman strength, stamina, invulnerability, but he also has, you know, shape shifting and phasing and density shifting and heat vision and it's just like it's got everything so in the comics uh mcgann has a lot of these things as well she's got superhuman strength and stamina on par with a kryptonian who's under a yellow sun near invulnerable normally but when you pair it with her density shifting powers that she could use to increase her density which we haven't seen much in the show instead of becoming incorporeal this becomes an incredibly powerful ability she can survive in space she can regenerate she can shape shift she has full on invisibility in the comics of course her telepathy which is not just telepathy in the comics it includes creating mental illusions controlling minds memory alteration her telekinesis Something they go back and forth on in the comics is what they call Martian vision, which, as I mentioned before, is basically the same as Kryptonian's heat vision. And also in the comics, they talk about the Martians having nine senses. I'm not sure what all nine of those are. Might have to do more research, but apparently they have a lot of senses. So in Young Justice, it's a little bit different. They've kind of toned her down or not really toned her down. They've focused her a little bit more, which I think is important and taken some artistic liberty, which is also something I think is important as well. And we can learn something from storytelling in this also. So she has some suggestion of superhuman strength and durability. She takes a lot of damage. There's a scene in Failsafe where she and Martian Manhunter take down a droid or a robot. She doesn't often get physical because she has her telekinesis to work with, and that's plenty. She doesn't need both, but there's still some suggestion of her having a greater than normal strength. So instead of invisibility in the series, she has what they call stealth mode or camouflage mode. And this is a much better storytelling, I think, element than a raw invisibility that implies you can't be seen at all. So the stealth mode allows characters like Sportsmaster or Superboy with his infrared vision or other characters to actually potentially see her, which raises that dramatic jeopardy, that tension, but also makes it so that she's still pretty effective with the majority of characters. She also has the phasing ability or incorporeal side of the density shifting power in season two, but they don't give it to her in season one. She says it's an advanced technique, which I think is also a really good way to handle it. Because if you have somebody who can basically become incorporeal and fully invisible, there's really just nothing in their way. (laughs) There's nothing standing in their way. And this makes it a little bit better. It's the same thing with Kid Flash, the fact that he can't do the the bare Allen trick of vibrating through walls and things like that helps to give some limitations to the storytelling. Uh, Of course, she has her telepathy. We find out in season two, she has some memory altering and memory stealing kind of powers, but we don't see her doing things like mental illusions and, you know, turning the whole team invisible by convincing somebody that they can't see them, stuff like that. So, you know, we'll we'll see how she develops into the next season, uh, particularly with Martian Manhunter stating pretty clearly that she's the strongest telepathic mind he's ever met. She does have her telekinesis, the limits of that are interesting. We I don't know if we know what the limits of that are. And then, of course, her shape-shifting. And I'm assuming some form of regeneration. We haven't seen her necessarily take a huge amount of damage and regenerate, but when you've got the shape-shifting and the density control and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> regeneration seems likely. Then we get into her quote-unquote weakness. Now, this is admittedly kind of an odd one, right? So the Martian's weakness 
around fire and heat is explained in the series as a physiological issue. It's a metabolic process. But we get the impression during the show that it's also a psychological process or a psychological fear. The comics haven't really done much to explain kind of this bizarre version of Martian kryptonite. Though one take is that the Guardians of the Galaxy, which is the race that created both the robotic Manhunters and the Green Lantern Corps, at some point in the past planted this kind of psychological weakness, this pyrophobia as a psychosomatic off switch for the Martians. The reason being that some craziness about Martians having having previously been a a warlike race that required fire and psychic craziness, torturing of others to reproduce. I don't know. This sounds pretty nuts to me. But I mean, if you're going to have the strength and powers of a Kryptonian under a yellow sun and then combine all these other powers with them, yeah. If they're warlike, that's a problem. So I like the take that it's simply a physiological issue because Mars is a cold planet. But since we see McGann implant a mental illusion-ish, so maybe kind of a hint at her mental illusion powers in Manhunter's head at the end of season one of being surrounded by fire and him screaming, it's possible that the showrunners may be planting the seed of something more psychological, maybe interesting in this particular weakness, or at least I I hope anyway. So in relation to Young Justice, this version of Miss Martian we get in the series kind of parallels that of the comics in only like a few ways. So she is a white Martian masquerading as a green. But as far as I can tell, the storyline of her kind of Megan Morse persona being created in response to a television show is entirely new, which means that the reveal of this in Young Justice was likely as much of a surprise to recent fans of Miss M as to those of us who didn't know the character very well. And I've talked about my initial distrust of the characters ugh, it's just stereotypical sitcom silliness before but i haven't i haven't i really sat down and talked about why so i have a daughter she's three at the time of this recording and is already in love with superheroes. In fact, just yesterday, she begged me to go out on errands in a cape and mask that she got for Christmas from my brother. The problem is there are only so many female superheroes that I can share with her, uh, even today. That's why the depiction of female heroes is so important to me and why my initial impression of McGann bug me so much. The thing is the story of wanting to belong and the reflection of that desire in a character who can literally change at a genetic level into what's required to experience that belonging is incredibly shockingly powerful. The early parts of McGann's story become educational opportunities about appropriate behavior for both McGann and like Wally (laughs) for that matter in relation to my daughter as she's growing up. But the larger story of her arc becomes such an important morality tale about allowing yourself to be you who you are. The problem isn't that she modeled her earth persona like a fangirl. That's not really the problem. Being inspired by your heroes helps to form a foundation from which you can explore the world, teaching us moral lessons. Superheroes are the mythologies of the modern age. The problem is that she didn't allow herself to reflect on the important parts of her self that weren't Megan Morse. The irony that McGann's voice actor, Danica McKellar, was once an incredibly popular child actor herself isn't lost on Danica's older fans, like me. And I think that Danica's personal experience fed into the amazing performances that she pulled off, especially in scenes like the one that we pulled for the beginning of this episode. If McGann's character growth in season one was an impressive piece of storytelling, then the five-year jump into season two and what we eventually find out happens between her and Superboy is absolutely heartbreaking. What the showrunners have created is less the classic comics Kryptonian analog Martian and reflects more on a hero whose telepathic powers lead her into intriguing and scary areas of human personality and what the threat of that kind of power can do. Comics are ripe with telepaths, but rarely, if ever, do they deal with the morality of memory changing or mind control or the extremely invasive nature of simply reading a person's mind. You add her telepathic powers to her ability to shape change, to turn invisible, or camouflage in the show's case, walk through walls, etc. And you get a character who we can only hope is morally good. Even her momentary step into the realm of, quote, taking the information from the villain's minds 
you know, unquote, stealing it makes us incredibly uncomfortable. To then hear that she tried to alter Superboy's mind moves into really scary territory. What would you do? What would you do with those powers? I mean, think about for myself, what would I do with those powers, right? Hers is the classic story of H.G. Wells' Invisible Man. If the morally questionable actions of Griffin, the lead character in The Invisible Man, were backed by the ability to control the minds of others and then change their memories of what they did or what he did, it's bonkers, right? It's just nuts. So when I say I'm impressed by writers who take the time to dive deeper into the bigger picture of what a character's life and psychological makeup would look like and how that would affect those around them, McGann's story is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm excited and I'm a bit terrified of what they'll show us of McGann in a season three. I just, I can't wait. So next time on Secret Origins, we dive into the storied, complex, insane history of Caleb's favorite Young Justice hero, Superboy. You can get a hold of us at the YJ Files on Twitter, www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, and by email at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. I would normally put in a fan service link to an AMV or artwork from again, but I hope you'll allow me a little self-indulgence here. In my discussion session with Quinn Wilson on linguistics and psychology in Young Justice, we talk quite a bit about McGann and the implications of what her powers are and what her character represents about human nature, both psychologically and physically, really. Uh, I just, I highly recommend you check that out if you haven't already. And huge thanks again to Quinn for coming on the show and having that conversation. As always, please hashtag keep binging YJ, hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology, and join us for our next regular episode of the Young Justice Files. Stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.